Welcome everybody to our 91st Learn Fast webinar uh, that we've been doing since the pandemic started. And uh, we have a great guest today. Somebody, something I've been wanting to do for quite a while is, um, is, is talk about uh, driver coaching and how driver coaches use data and video and what some of, the, you know, some of their tools are and what's, what's important to them. Um, I think it's a value to, to folks that uh, are being coached to hear some of these things, as well as folks that maybe won't, will not get a coach, but are to, uh, to be able to listen to some of these fellas' ways that they do their business and, and get some tips from them and the way they set things up, what they're looking for, and maybe uh, help you do a little bit of self-coaching as well. So i uh, like to uh, welcome our guest today, Thomas Merrill. Thomas, let me jump to the next slide. Thomas has been uh, been racing for quite a while. First karting championship, 1998. He, he came up through that path. A lot of folks do. Uh, went into open wheel stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, Pacific F2000 Formula Car champion in 2007, and um, and then uh, jumped into the big cars. Right, you have these uh, the big heavy cars compared to your uh, karting and and your Formula Car stuff. But and still is uh, doing a lot of Trans Am stuff. We'll have him introduce himself a little bit deeper in a little bit. Uh, Three-time Daytona 24-hour participant, including I think this uh, this last year. We'll have him uh, talk to us a little bit about that. And when it comes to the to the instruction side, it, 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 a lot of top-line drivers like Thomas uh, end up doing a lot of instruction. And and uh, Thomas has worked with some of the best top driving schools in the, in the country, um, uh, Skip Barber, Allen Berg, Sim Raceway, USA, AMG, uh, to get lots of great uh, techniques and processes. And, and uh, it's, it's gonna be pretty cool to listen to him and, uh, and chat around since this is his first time being here as a webinar guest. Thank you, Thomas, for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, is there anything else you can add, uh, add about yourself and give us an idea of who we're, uh, who we're chatting with today? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Roger. It's really cool to be a part of this. It's, it's gonna be a lot of fun to, look at some surprise data today and, and just <laughs> go over exactly what the methodology is behind using it for coaching. And as far as a, a professional driver myself, my career path is a bit opposite of most. A lot of drivers will have this arc of, of professional driving and, and when they struggle to maybe keep busy, they'll start coaching on the side. And in my case, it was the opposite. I, I had a very short rise in my early career focused on coaching a lot earlier, focused on building a driver coaching business. And via that driver coaching business, made a lot of the connections that have now turned into full-time race drives for me. So um, I'm a bit opposite of how most guys do it um, and very much still a full-time driver coach in addition to the driving that I'm doing lately. So I'm um, staying very, very busy. Very cool. I think there's so many different ways to get to where you are. All of them hard, all of them very mm -hmm. difficult, and all of them take a ton of work and uh, something to be proud of that you're able to uh, uh, to be at this spot in your career. It's uh, it's pretty cool having a full coaching calendar plus being able to to continue to race and keep your skills up and and uh, and keep meeting mm -hmm. people right and keep doing what you're doing. So, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. The um, uh, Thomas made mention of it real quickly there on his way by that. Uh, uh, going to look at some data that uh, surprise data, right? And uh, uh, he, he has not been given this data ahead of time. Almost every driver coach that I talk with, uh, the, the, the few that we've had on here already, um, I'll always say that same thing is, uh, and Thomas mentioned it to me yesterday as we were just chatting. He says, uh, you know, having it, uh, having it be kind of just, you know, boom, put pop it in front of me. Let, let's see where it goes is, uh, is a bit of a, is a bit of a challenge. I think all these guys like, and, and, uh, they, they love to, to, to be able to see it and react to it and then have everybody watch that. I think that'll be kind of fun as well. So, so he hasn't had a chance to really look over this data at all. So it'll be kind of fun. So the, um, um, we're going to jump right in. We're going to we're going to uh, take a, a little bit of a um, uh, of attack that is is should we we're going to look at some Race Studio two stuff and uh, and then uh, maybe we'll start off with a, a, the concept of Race Studio two, but but the basic channels like the user has a solo right, so the GPS based channels only, and then we'll act uh, we'll 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 throw in you know the steering throttle brake and. Uh, <clears throat> And chat about that a little bit, and then we'll uh, and then we'll jump in uh, and maybe take a little a few laps in Race Studio Three with uh, with the video. So, but before we get started, Thomas, I got a couple of questions. I just like to to get a feel of uh, your perspective as a coach, what you like to see you know, as you're uh, as as you get a new student, somebody that maybe you haven't worked with before. Um, a couple of things. How do you how do you prepare? 
um, uh, you, you, you take different uh, you know, students or clients that you're going to be working with, and you're going to be working one, you know, say in this, this coming weekend, how do you prepare for working with the client? Is there, is there anything you do in particular? Or do, you, do you go back and forth on email, video chat, previously look at some of his data, find some of his video? What, uh, how do you prepare to work with a, with a new client? It's a good question. Um, it, it, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is, is most of the time I don't get to prepare. Um, a lot of times when, I, when I'm working with a, a driver, uh, for the first time, I'm either subbing for a friend of mine who normally coaches that driver, um, or it's it's a kind of a last minute deal. So it's fun to kind of jump in there and just get a sense of who they are um, at the morning of whatever day it is that we're working together. Um, and my favorite thing to do is is the first session they drive the car is not talk on the radio at all or or get too involved in 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 pushing the coaching on them, but sort of understand their personality and the driving style. And then kind of go from there. But to answer your question, that from a preparation standpoint, if I if I get to prepare, I'll I'll just look at brief data and brief video to get a sense of what the driver is currently comfortable doing. And a lot of times I'll take the data that they have if they have it and look for the, the pedal channels and get an idea on are they confident on brake application, are they confident on throttle application? Um, do they do they know? what the grip in their car is and, and do they know how to use it? And, and that's really the big differentiator between, you know, is it, is it about making this driver comfortable or is it about making this driver faster? Um, and you're always doing both of those things, but you can tailor the feedback and the focus based on the driver's current comfort level. So that's really what I'm really trying to identify early on. And a lot of times the video can do that. So if they've got some smarty cam video, and then the video like, like this page shows where the video is over the driver's shoulder, you can see their hands moving on the wheel. You can get a sense of their personality behind the wheel as well. And it can inform, you know, what type of coaching they may take. They may be really active or they may be really passive or whatever. So uh, the more information I have, the better, but frankly, most of the time I don't get access even, to even get that it. even get that yeah. right motorsports is a quickly yeah. changing uh, 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 -huh. uh operation right so the it's yeah. interesting that you say when with, with your preparation or you know sometimes you don't get it at all but when you do have it it's more looking at wh where the driver is in the process and what their style is right if you're not actually yeah. looking at data you're not actually in your own mind starting the plan of uh is he turning in too early or is he breaking, you know, mm -hmm. taking too much time to go from gas to brake or whatever it happens to be. It's more getting up to speed on that, that person and that, and their, and their, um, and their, their, their process, their place in, in, in motorsports and then being ready to coach. That's interesting. Totally. The, uh, when you do get, get ready to begin coaching somebody, what are, what are your most important tools? And, and by what I mean by that is, where do you fit in, or, or it may change per, per student, but where does data versus video, and, and, and on the data side, is there a, a set of channels that are really important to you? The, the, the best channel to start with is always the speed trace, right? But um, if, if you can pair a speed trace with throttle and brake to start with, that's really the, the base uh, template that I'm working with. And, and if I'm lucky enough to have a steering trace, I'll, I'll throw that up there too. Um, if you don't have either of the pedal channels, then it's a matter of latitude and or longitudinal and lateral G in pairing with the speed trace. But sometimes I'll just look at the speed trace. You can you can look at the shape of the speed trace and, and learn all of that information if you know how to look at it closely. Um, and so sometimes that's enough. Um, and, and my my personal template that I start with has has speed at the top and then throttle, brake, and steering kind of on, on its way down. And, at the bottom, I might throw some G channels in there if I if I need them, but I try to keep it as simple as possible. There's there's always more to look at than you might need to see, <laughs> so I try to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, we have a we, 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 a lot of the folks that are watching here here today are watching us on video on YouTube later. We 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 talk a lot about the speed channel being the money channel, and that's basically what mm -hmm. you just said. You can get so much out of just that speed trace, you know, comparing yeah. it against compar by itself, or even comparing it against uh, another another drivers. And then the uh, and, and with the GPS based channels, the uh, lateral and longitudinal G's, you're you're probably what would you say eighty percent there of getting mm -hmm. what you would need. And then of course the, uh, you know, the throttle position, brake pressure, steering is, is then answering that, uh, the, the remainder of those questions of why you're seeing some of those things. That's kind of interesting. 
Totally. Where, where does video fit into uh, your driver coaching side? Is is it a is it a go to? If it's there, you're going to use it every time, or is it is it mm-hmm. data first, video second, or or how does that work for you? It depends on the driver. Some drivers really absorb data well. Um, a lot of them will struggle with data absorption as far as as a coaching directive. So a lot of a lot of times I'll use the data as my education, and I'll use the video as their education. So. I can find what I need to look at and, and what needs to change in the data. But as far as communicating that to the driver as, far as what they're going to do differently to, to change it, the video is, is usually far more helpful because it's more tangible for the average driver to see, you know, car position, head position, hand position, all those things. It, it, it ties it all together. And a lot of times when I look at that data video pairing, I, I look at the data as the what and the video as the why. And, and use that method of, of going, okay, this, this is what we can see in the data, but that's, that's the end goal. We always need a method of how we're gonna get there. And I, the, a, one phrase that I always use when I'm, I'm talking to drivers is you know, I, I could give you a fish, but I'd rather give you a fishing pole. I could tell you, I need you to apex here, but I'd rather teach you how to apex there or how to break better so that you can find the answer on your own. And if you can do that, it'll, it'll, it'll retain a lot better with the driver and they'll take that and build from it. Um, and that's kind of part of the method of, uh, and we'll get into this when we look at, at, at the data set as a whole, but um, it, what, what I try to do is find a, a, a piece in the lap that's a tool they can use, not just in that one corner. It's something that applies everywhere around the whole racetrack. And, um, it, it becomes more about the method and less about the, you know, the objective or, or the, the, the ones and zeros of, yes, you need to do this better. Um, so it's more about the think, how. Yeah. I think that's a great, a, a great way of doing it. What adds the value because then down the road, you, you don't teach them just how to take that one corner of the apex for that one, you know, turn two. Uh, it, it's mm-hmm. how, how are you approaching it? How are you determining that? And then they can apply that not only on that day, but uh, on subsequent uh, driving you know, the rest of the time that they're uh, in the sport. So right. very, very cool. We have a saying around here is, you know, what happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? I, I thought that was pretty cool when you just mentioned that you can look at the data and figure out what happened and, 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 and where. And sometimes that that video might be your why, right? Because mm-hmm. you can actually mm-hmm. look at the, if the video is placed correctly, you end up being able to see where they were on the track. When did they turn in? You know, were they jerky hands? Were they, you know, uh, those kind of things. So it's uh, very cool that you kind of fit right into some of the stuff that we talk about here. So um, another question I had before, we, as we're to kind of tied together with what we just talked about was, is the video. Uh, the, we're looking at a slide here. We're going to look at some video and some data here in a moment. But uh, uh, video camera placement is, uh, is, is becoming more and more critical all the time. In our Race Studio 3 software, which we're going to look at right at the end of the webinar today, we now have the video tucked in as, as pictured here on this one slide, the picture, the video tucked in with the data. And, and sometimes when you put up that second slide and you're trying to see exactly when the driver turned in on his, on his two, two video, you know, two slides, two video files. And uh, boy, if you have the thing way over or really turned, it gives you a false, uh, this is a perfect example here. If I put my cursor over here, you can see this, uh, this mm-hmm. antenna and uh, on, on, on both, both videos from the two different laps. And, uh, and, and if you're trying to pick out when they turned in and when, you know, how much were they turned in and pointing down towards the apex, it, boy, having that camera as much you know, more towards the middle of the car and more pointed straight down the car is going to be helpful. But uh, also talk about uh, making sure we can see his hands and feet. Is that important to you? It's it's super valuable. And actually, at, while you were saying that, I, I remembered recently a, a new driver that um, I got paired to work with sent me some of his video to prepare, um, like your, your earlier question. And I, I when I opened the video, I, my heart kind of sunk because it, the, the camera was just right up against the windshield looking mm-hmm. at the hood of the car. So it's like, OK, you know, I, I can I can look at your driving line and stuff. But what I can't see is you. And that's the most important part is is putting that that camera over your shoulder in a location where I can see your hands at a minimum. If I could see your feet, that's great, too. But what I really want to see is your head. And particularly in a car that that like a tin top car, if you can put the camera kind of put over the driver's shoulder in such a way that you can actually see the rear view mirror, you can see the driver's head and the head turn and the timing of where the driver's looking and when 
it's a massive tool for for helping understand different motivations um, for for some of the technique that you may see in the data. Um, so like like the the freeze frame here suggests with the radical, that's a decent position. Yeah. But if you moved it more towards the center of the car, you'd get even better because you may start to see the driver's head and and see a little bit of that personality as well. And the perspective of the camera looking straight down the car is, is when you're comparing rotation of the car, when did they rotate, how much have they rotated down towards the apex is becoming more important. I don't think it's as important to, as being able to see hands and feet and helmet, but we're getting closer mm -hmm. on that, I think. I do yeah, see the questions look. stacking up over there and I, and I'm, I read them and, and we're going to fit them all in. The, so don't uh, don't worry that we haven't uh, chatted about your question yet. I, I, when I see them and I know they're going to go somewhere, I'm going to go, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to hold those till then. So the, uh, the only one that I'd like to uh, touch on that uh, before we move on is Bruce has a question here. As you progressed in data coaching, Thomas, did you find that you have to, you, you had to change your technique as you dug deeper into data? What, what uh, for your own driving and for your coaching, uh, getting better at that, when you started to work deeper in data, have you evolved in, in some of the stuff that you've worked with? Yeah, and it, data is just more prevalent than it, it was when I started coaching. Um, and it's sort of a given at this point that everyone has data. And, and when someone wants to hire me to coach, the first thing, I won't ask them, do they have data? I'll ask them, what kind of data do you have? <laughs> so exactly. um, it's kind of, it's one of those things. I, I was laughing with another driver coach the other day. We, we used the, the race monitor, the race hero, live timing apps on our phone. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too long ago that I was just using a stopwatch to do split times and, and exactly. keep track of other cars. And now I've got this app on my phone that does it for me. And when it fails, I am frustrated and I, <laughs> because I no longer have my stopwatch. <laughs> yeah, I'm like tied to this thing. And I feel that way with, with data is, is a lot of times I feel I'm almost tied to it from a coaching perspective and, and I need to, an important thing that I try to do is, is understand, okay, if I don't have this, how am I going to, how am I going to coach? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's now it's just such a cornerstone of, of the coaching behavior. But you know, to the question about how is data, how has data evolved driver coaching? The big thing is the integration of the video and the data together, yeah. because the, the, the data itself is massively helpful. But the challenge is always, how do I communicate what needs to change and how does it need to change? Um, what, looking at two lines across a graph, you can see the difference and you can quantify that and it's very helpful. Um, but it's usually much more difficult to go, okay, you know, from the driver's perspective, I see that. I see that I need to go faster, but I don't quite understand how I'm going to do that. And yeah. so if I could pair the video and the data together, it, it ties that whole experience together. And usually you see the learning curve sharpen quite a bit um probably I, I you know probably a lot of your uh, your clients don't have a ton of data experience so the video makes that a much easier the, the learning style of seeing that visually and, and and being able to see a driver do something uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. To, to repeat it is, is easier than looking at a than looking at a speed trace and a lateral g trace and showing where they're turning in a little bit too late or something right so it's learning style based as much as uh ease of use right yes absolutely and and, and yeah actually the, the the main thing that's changed i i kind of take it for granted now but early on when i started coaching it was more looking at the driver's data in a vacuum and the more, more that i coached the more that i started to use reference data of myself or somebody else driving as the critical tool of understanding relativity understanding very you know car setup quality and things like that so um you know you can look at at at, from a from a textbook standpoint, what does the brake trace need to look at? How hard should you be braking? What should your throttle commitment look like? And are you carrying good corner speed? But if you've got somebody demonstrating exactly what that looks like, it makes it very, very easy to quantify. Okay, there's 10 miles an hour on the table for you at the apex of turn seven. And you know that as a, from a coaching tool, I can say, well, if you went five miles an hour faster, there's grip on the table. So you're actually not taking a risk and asking more of the car by my ability to quantify, there's this much available. So here's your method of how you're gonna go find that piece by piece. You can't just so tell the guy to go faster in turn three. You got you have to give him some ideas of how that's gonna happen, right? Yes, yeah. and yeah. Mo most importantly, if I work with a, with a new client I've never worked before, worked with before, if I can get in their car, I can verify that the car will actually do, what, do I, what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. It's, it's very common that I get in and I go, oh, the setup does not allow for what I thought it should. And so it's either a question of, okay, I need to coach them a, to drive this thing a different way, or we need to work on the car setup to make sure that 
the data looks the way it should and they should be driving the way that 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 they should based on a quality car as opposed to a car that that has various limitations how important is it to to your coaching style how how often do you just talked about it that you like to do it but that reference lap where you can get in the car and 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 take it out and and do two or three laps and just get one on the table one in the data one in the video Mm -hmm. versus the client only data you can't write seat right you can't you can't getting in there getting some data then rather than just looking at just theirs how important is that to you it's massive yeah you just mentioned it but uh, you know I'll, i'll say that it's not impossible to coach without it but it makes it so much more efficient to have the reference to say, okay, this is absolutely what, what, what the goal is, as opposed to saying, well, I think you could go a little bit deeper here and let's work towards this. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking a, a process that may take a whole week and narrowing it down to something you can accomplish in one day uh, by, by having a known quantity for what the goal is. And it's really a, the most important thing with racing in general is to have defined goals. And, and anytime you, you strap your helmet on and, and go out on the racetrack, you should know what, what the purpose of, of that's going to be outside of just having fun. It's okay. What, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna maintain my technique? Is my goal to go a little bit faster? Am I going to work on these three corners? You know, am I going to work on breaking as a whole being more specific is, is always a good idea. Just, if you're driving around by yourself and then having a coaching perspective involved, if you can quantify, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to go do by this much. It just makes it way more efficient. Perfect. Uh, the uh, Char- Charles has a, has a question there. I want to get to before we jump into some data it is the student is setting up a, an in-car camera. They've got their one, their one view. Uh, kind of peeking on this uh, radical that we're looking at here, what, what is that optimum view pointed at? Is it, uh, Charles's question goes into hands, feet, front, front windshield, other, um, pr- probably all, right? But if, if you had to, what's the most important? Is it, is it the hands that, are, that would be the critical one? Like in a, this radical, you can't really see the feet well unless you have the camera really low. What uh, is, mm-hmm. is the hands, is that the secret to the car? Is that uh, where For you sure. want to kind of start? For sure. The, the, the hands is definitely anywhere centrally located in the car that can see the hands and out the windshield would be the, the, the rule of thumb to start with. And, and depending feet, on yeah. the, 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 the wide angle of the lens, maybe you can see a little bit more. But, you know, if you can imagine that the, the cameras in the middle of the car behind or between the two, the two seats, if it's a sedan, you can see a pillar to a pillar. And, and in that view, you've got the steering wheel. And if you're lucky, you got the head or the helmet. Um, and then depending on the exposure settings or whatever, you may pick up the feet as well. Yeah. Um, but that central location that you, where you can see the hands. And by the way, if you can have a, a pair of gloves that's brightly colored like this driver does, <laughs> that's super helpful as well because it makes it much easier to see it in varying light conditions. Um, I'm always a fan of red gloves because it, it, it just helps me see. <laughs> Black gloves are the worst. And it helps, it helps the other drivers see your hands for, for hand signals yeah. too, right? The, yeah. <laughs> perfect. The, uh, uh, sometimes Kyle talks about one before we jump in, and, and uh, all of these are great questions. I, I, I enjoy this. Uh, Kyle races in the spec Miata world, and uh, mm-hmm. where, where you maybe are working with somebody, and the difference on a, on a minute and a half, two minute track is three tenths of a second that you're trying to find, right? So it's, uh-huh. you're, you're never going to find three tenths of a second in one corner. So then, it, the, the more general question here for you is, is what kind of a coaching technique, what, how do you begin to fine tune, get down there to finding hundreds in, in five mm-hmm. or six corners that add up to that three tenths? Are you looking for, I'll, I'll throw this out and you, uh, you comment on it. Uh, I have found a lot of times you look at that time compare down here at the bottom and the, a guy that's three tenths off of the of his teammate, and it just barely climbs up all the way throughout the lap. In mm-hmm, other words, there's not mm-hmm. one corner where the problem is. So then you got to work, you got to dig in, and you got to find out. Okay, what is that driver doing better? Is it always on the braking? Is it it's a mid corner? Is it uh, you know a transition? You know, time? is that where the thing humps up every time? How do you find those 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 trends where you find just little tiny things? That's a good question, uh, and that that's that's the hardest thing. Yeah. And what what that comes down to is more of of looking deeper into the data from a from a driving perspective, and looking for behavior that indicates the driver is more in tune with the communication of the the car on the tire and everything that they're activating. And and 
a lot of that is down to timing. So you, you may see brake traces, throttle traces that, that all look as they should, but then there's a, there's a little bit of a time delta. And when you look a little deeper, you can look at the relative timing of those driving inputs. And what, what a really good driver is always going to do is, is have a conversation with the car. The car is talking to you the whole time you're driving it, whether you're listening to it or not. And, and the best drivers are constantly asking the car questions and then listening to the answers. And so sometimes the steering trace can be very helpful as far as the driver's activation of the tire and their, their feedback as far as whether or not they're, they're getting the answer back from the car, whether it's smooth or, or aggressive is really, you know, uh, apples and oranges. There's no right answer there. But what you can what you can see from one driver compared to another is, is this driver more proactive or more reactive in their technique relative to the limitations of the car? And so um, so there's a question about, you know, that is it is it about getting a new car or is it about teaching to drive around that those the limitations of the car? At the end of the day, there is no perfect race car. They all have their flaws and you always kind of want to engage the car in such a way that helps you maintain an awareness of where that limit is as often as possible. And um, <laughs> in, in my own personal experience, I'll give my students video of, of myself driving a lot of times before a race weekend, like with a lot of drivers I coach in Trans Am, I'll give them a, a, a preparation packet that includes a video of me driving around the racetrack, talking my way through what I'm doing and why. And I'll comment on, you know, you're going to see a lot of steering wheel activity here. And that's not because you have to do that. It's because that's my style of asking the car a question and then listening for the answer and being pretty aggressive about it because maybe I have only a couple laps to do it. But if you watch my video throughout the weekend, you go to the, my last video of the weekend, you're going to see my hands slow down quite a bit because I, I kind of know the answer to the question already. So I'm not, I'm not asking the car to talk to me quite as often. I'm a little bit more smooth. I, I have a little bit more of a known quantity. Um, and so that's what you're always trying to achieve. And, and through the process of doing that, you can, you can learn a driver's style and, and how they interpret the car, uh, which is something that, that is difficult to find in the data. You can find it if you know how to look for it and if you're looking deep enough. Um, but that's where the video tells the story a little bit more is, is the personality of how the driver is engaging the car, engaging the tire, and then most importantly, listening for the answer and, and driving in a, in a sympathetic way to the, the car's limitations. Let's, let's dial into that one, <clears throat> pardon me, just a little bit more. Kyle asked the question, uh, the, the driver being reactive versus proactive, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see that mm -hmm. mostly in the hands? Is that where you see it? it be, because of you, you've you asked for something and it, and it, it tells you this, uh -huh. okay, next time we'll ask for just a little bit less. Is that, is that you're seeing it in the hands or you're seeing it in the feet? It's easiest, particularly if you're looking at the data, in my experience, it's easiest to see that in the hands from a, a reactionary standpoint. And it has a, the very same relationship to the data and the video together. So earlier we talked about the data being the what and the video being the why. If you're only looking at the data and you're trying to figure that out, you can look at the steering trace as the what, and then you look at the pedal inputs and then there's your why. There you and go. a lot of times the driver will, will not necessarily be conscious about the, dri the pedal inputs, but we're always conscious about our hands because we can see them <laughs> and we're, we're, we're touching the wheel and, and that's more intuitive from a control standpoint. And a lot of times the driver will make life harder for themselves by being more automatic or, or um, subconscious about their footwork. And then you see the hands reacting to that input. And, and if we can get those two things tied together, it, it makes for ultimately a more in control driver, but um, hopefully a faster one as well. Yeah, there are times when you should be a little bit out of control, right? It's a, you talk, you talk <laughs> yeah. about it where, you know, sometimes hustling the car is the right thing to do. Sometimes having it mm -hmm. under you is the, is the right thing to do. Uh, qualifying mm -hmm. versus a long race when you're trying to, you know, keep the tires underneath the car. There, the, uh, even low horsepower cars, there are times when you should be throwing it in there and getting it to maybe use a little bit of that, uh, that yaw to help slow the car down, get it to rotate. It's, it's a funny world out there. It's not a, it's not a perfect thing. Different cars, different tracks different styles of corners and different drivers mm -hmm. it's it's funny interesting world the um let's jump in we got about uh, about 25 minutes left of, of of looking at stuff let's go ahead and jump in and and take a look at some data and i think we'll fit some of these other questions into that particular thing so uh i'm going to bring up um this is some data we've used in webinars in the past and it's uh, this is a uh, uh, homestead florida 
uh, a Ferrari challenge car. And, uh, and, and I thought what we would do, it kind of fits into David's, uh, David had a question here uh, right off the bat with uh, what, what about when there is no video and kind of what we're going to work with here in our, in our first ones, David, so that's why I kind of saved that question is here we've got some Race Studio 2 data. There might be some video somewhere, but we don't have it, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna chat with, with Thomas and, and have him just look at this, this lap, and then maybe we'll, we'll uh, open up a, a driver here in a minute uh, in the same data that uh, maybe was a little bit quicker, but I, I'd love to go through, uh, maybe just kind of start at the beginning of the lap or whatever you see here with, with speed on the top line, lateral Gs in the middle, uh, longitudinal Gs on the bottom, kind of like you've mm -hmm. got a solo without any ECU data or anything. Mm -hmm. Think about that, and then we'll uh, we'll open up a second lap, and we'll add some you know we'll add some channels. In this particular case, we do have the 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 feet and the hands, right? We've got uh, throttle, brake, and and uh, and steering as well. So when you first get your data, you you you've got your your uh, your student here, the the person you've downloaded the data real quickly. You you start to look at it. You talked earlier about speed trace was a big one. Of course, you're going to study this a little bit. Uh, what what are your steps when you first you, you take that 30 seconds to look this over? The guy sitting next to you and you're just scanning. What what are you looking for? <laughs> It, it, sometimes it takes more than 30 seconds. <laughs> depending you're on probably going to start but, talking a little bit while yeah. you're still digging, right? But, uh, so. Totally. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's, it's easier and that, and, and like, like in this case, if you, if you didn't have the longitudinal or, or lateral G channels and you're just looking at the speed traces, one of the easiest things to look for is uh, the, the minimum speeds across the lap. If, if they're, if they're flat or they're not, if they don't come to a point, it's a driver that's probably not maximizing uh, their corner entry performance very well. And they're picking up the power maybe a little bit early and then second guessing that power input as they continue to complete the corner. Um, so a lot of times that can point to, to a, a, a vision strategy that, that may need to be adjusted or a braking style. Um, so the, the, the turn four sector there, uh, which is a hairpin corner, um, just looking at the speed trace, you can you notice a slight convex shape to the way the car slows down, uh, which indicates that the driver is slowing the car down better in the second half of that brake zone. Yeah, um, steep, steeper in this half, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Normally that means the driver's initial brake may not be as good as it should be, or maybe the driver's intentionally not braking hard at the beginning because they don't know where they're going to go next. And as the car slows down, they're they're picking up more visuals on how fast they need to go and, and, and what their plan is going to be. And, and then if you add the longitudinal uh, trace there towards the bottom, what you can see is variance in, in the car's braking efficiency. Um, so you see the car slow down pretty well at the beginning. It doesn't slow down as well through the middle, and then it starts slowing down more towards the end. And, and so there's a lot of variance in, in the pedal activity there from, from this driver. And so what I, what I would then ask the driver is, is what, what's your braking reference there in that turn four hairpin? And you know, what, what are you, what are you basing your, your sensory inputs off of? And, and how can we get a little bit more specific about this? Um, and, and what's, what's different about uh, the turn two hairpin where you can see that the, the, the D cell trace is a little bit more defined. And actually in the case of that, you can see the driver is actually looking for a reason to get off the brake. So towards the end of the brake zone, the speed trace starts to vary quite a bit. So, Maybe the driver half of the brake zone turns their head, they pick up the apex, they go, oh, this is plenty. And they, they come off the brake and maybe they come off the brake too early and too much. And that's why the speed trace at the bottom is a little bit flat where they, they've, they've recognized their cornering speed, but the car is not pointed at the next straightaway yet. So now they've got to wait and, and before they can accelerate again. And you can see the um, hesitate, and you can see that hesitation here in the in the longitudinal G. I, interesting that you you seen really quickly. Just to recap, you seen this one had the bulge, right? It, mm -hmm. it gets steeper here at the bottom. This one almost a nice, perfect um, straight line down. And I, when you were talking about it, I was looking at that, thinking, okay, I'll, I'll add this. And then you added in that little part there that my eye did not catch. So, uh, and you can see it down here with this nice looking longitudinal trace. And then boom, all of a sudden it comes up and it kind of has this hockey stick before it comes on the way up. So uh, perfect. I, I, I like to see that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and <laughs> the, the challenge then becomes, okay, every corner here has something to look at, but what's, yeah. what's the low hanging fruit? What's, what's going to be the easiest to, to fix and what's going to be the most thematic? 
And that always goes back to what type of car we're driving. And, and knowing that this is a Ferrari Challenge car, I know that that car slows down really well. The brakes on those cars work phenomenally well. The ABS is very sophisticated. And it's a great place for a driver to find comfort and confidence in using that tool to its maximum and then being proactive about how they use that tool. So I'm going to start by looking at the brake zones and going, okay, where are you doing a good job with the brakes? Where can you do a better job with the brakes? And how can we make a plan for the next session that gives you the ability to use the brakes as well as you're doing in, in turn two, for example, and then do it everywhere else? You know, is there a reason why you can't use the brakes as well in turn four or turn one uh, by comparison? Um, or even there's a, there's a corner there towards the beginning of, of the turn six sector um, where there's a brake zone where the, 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 the longitudinal G trace is like a perfect triangle where the, the maximum decel happens right towards the middle of the brake zone. Are you not getting the car pointed to make that brake zone straight so that you can brake hard initially? Are you waiting until the center point, the corner, then braking hard? And is there a way to optimize that? Um, and in my experience, it's always best to focus on on keeping it simple and minimizing the amount of things you're going to focus on for the next session. And the best way to do that is to focus on one control input that can be thematic so that you can go, okay, I'm just going to work on this one thing, but I'm going to be able to work on this one thing everywhere. So rather than working on turn four this session where you can only really do it once per lap, I go, well, let's work on braking and let's work on braking well everywhere on the whole lap. So you've got five, six, seven, eight opportunities to work on that per lap and really kind of drill in that good, that good habit. Perfect. Perfect. And then the, um, the, the next thing I know you would probably love to do is, is have that second, a second driver's data, right? Maybe it's yes. you, you, a, a lap you were able to put in on reference. If you weren't able to get out there, the team has four cars or whatever, and you grab the fastest one of the guys, right. And, and stick them in there. So let me, uh, let me open up uh, another, um, another lap here of the same, same data. So it's this one here. And, and now what we've, what we've got here is we've got a, can, can everybody see that? Okay. Um, the, the purple and the yellow, maybe take that purple and make it, uh, maybe make it yellow. Maybe that'll make it jump out at us a little bit better. So you've got your blue and your yellow blue is the fellow that we've been just coaching with the single lap. And now all of a sudden you see this data and uh, now we're starting to look at a couple of things you pointed out and I'll, and I'll just say them and then you can maybe help me uh, get in there and take a look mm, at them. Sure. You, you talked about rolling corners, right? How rounded and how pointed. And we found a couple of them that were pointed, but now we're looking at this yellow driver. And if you look at every, virtually every apex uh, of, of the speed, they're, they're, they're much more V'd out, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you would see right off the bat? And then what would you tell your driver uh, when you see that? Totally, yeah, and and that that would be something to think about as as like an. Oops, it froze up a little bit. Anybody? Uh, I, I, I looks like I'm still active. Looks like we lost him for a second. Maybe we'll see if we can get him back. If somebody could throw in the chat that you're here. Okay, just uh, just him. Okay, Thomas, if you're not hearing me, maybe you can uh, maybe log out and log back in real quickly. And that would be uh, that would be good. But you, is your goal should be there you go. based on a, a certain point of acceleration. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's there okay. You're, you're you're back now. You're back now. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, as from a, a braking perspective, um, have, having the corners beat out is a good end goal. But being able to get there proactively means usually over slowing the corner and then getting better at your braking references to find the right location. And the reference data shows that. The reference data shows that the, the, the reference driver is more confident in brake location, is able to brake deeper based on the, 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 the appropriate braking reference. And then that allows that driver to be more proactive on, on the brake release. But what I would say to this, the driver I'm coaching on, on the blue lines is I like the way you're releasing the brake in that first brake zone. Uh, just based on the shape of the speed trace, I can see that the car is slowing down very efficiently, but as it approaches its minimum speed, the speed trace is very round and progressive. Whereas in the next, you know, over there where the cursor is, you can see how the speed trace, there's a corner, a very defined corner of decel to minimum speed where the driver's getting off the brake all at once yeah. and, um, and then having to wait in the middle of the corner. Versus the yellow line, you can see that it's very steep 
that as the yellow line approaches its minimum speed, it tapers off a little bit and it makes this nice shape down to the minimum speed where it then abruptly accelerates from again. And so the first step is let's break better. Then let's look at where we can break better now that we have, a, have confidence in that tool. And the last step is once you're breaking better, let's adjust our visual perspective so that we have a good reason to start releasing the brake. And this driver is already doing a great job of looking ahead in turn one, because you can see the brake release happens very proactively and smooth. In these more intense hairpins where the approach speed's a bit higher, this driver is more concerned about making the corner. And so they're maintaining that peak brake pressure for longer and, and allowing that fear to be the primary motivator as opposed to a proactive, I wanna go that direction. Pop, so let's pop. pick the eyes up, let's look to the apex and let's release the brake smoothly and carry more speed to that point. Um, it, it's always tricky to ask a driver to carry more entry speed yeah. because then the question is, how do you do that? And, and so usually that's kind of towards the end of once we know how to release the brake properly, we can worry about entry speed and, 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 I, and well, before we, we, what I should have said is before we think about how we're releasing the brake properly, we should be able to brake well, we should be able to brake well at the same location, lap to lap, at which point we can then make an educated decision on brake release. And then the entry speed sort of happens organically from there. It's not really as much of a thought process as it is an intuitive decision. And some of you might have seen what I did there, and I, I see in the chat a couple of folks seen it. The the the, the laps weren't aligned well, and um, mm -hmm. different start finish lines, whatever. So what I did is I came up to the snap mode, and I turned that on, and then I adjusted. And the way that I always do it is, yeah, you can with with decent drivers, you can pretty much just look at the center of the corner and and adjust to that by looking, you know, aligning the points. But mm -hmm. what I always do is I look at the GPS map, and I and I put the two X's on top of each other, and now that gave us a much more realistic view of what we were looking at by having the taking up some out some of that misalignment that, that happens occasionally so the um, um all good the uh the other one that i that i noticed here is and, and you said it that i just wanted to reset restate it is you can see see the yellow one coming down and, and it gets a little bit of that hockey stick right here near the end and right here near the end and, and big on this one right here near the end right and uh and it's all if you if you look at it and where it's all happening it's right it's it's where the driver is starting to trail break so it, while we may be looking at the shape of that uh, that brake zone, that speed trace coming down, that deceleration rate. Uh, you always, whenever you start to see a driver throw some away, you are thinking they're releasing the brake, but what they're really doing is trading some longitudinal for some lateral, right? And you can see that in in all of these, right where right where the driver is starting to turn in, he's having to release the brakes a little bit, kind of showing that they're maximized on the brakes, I suppose. So, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. So we've let's throw up there just because we've uh, now that we can, let's throw up um, you know the, the 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 three different pedals, right? That's interesting. I got one that's backwards. We can we'll let our eyes just play games with us on the uh, <laughs> uh, on that. The um, and the brake pressures must be in bar versus psi. Oh well. The uh, but now we can see if, if we focus on the throttle position, we can see that. Uh, Somebody talked about this blue one right here in the in the chat. It was, is a lazy shift, and and to me it was not an it was too much to be a lazy shift, right? And and now mm -hmm. that we get the throttle position up, we can see that uh, I don't know if he was you know, letting somebody get past him or, or 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 got loose off the corner or you know whatever, right? Uh, so, something happened there that just slowed him down a little bit. So now that we've got these pedal positions up there a little bit, and then the steering, what uh, what do you see there? Anything else that you see that uh, can be added to the uh, to the thought process? Well, we, we, we definitely yeah. talked about braking efficiency and, and, and how can we get the car slowing down better. And, and the one thing you can see looking at the yellow versus the, the blue is the rate at which the driver achieves maximum brake pressure. Um, and the, the yellow driver is doing a better job of identifying peak brake pressure and decel rate earlier um, in, in such a way that gives them confidence to, to then proactively release the brake. Um, the, the blue lines all have a lot of variance in, in the brake pressure, and they get to the peak brake pressure a little bit later in that brake zone. Um, and so some of that, I think, comes down to pedal uh, transition. Oftentimes, if a driver comes off of the pedal slower, they tend to apply the brake a little bit slower. Uh, so sometimes that's, that's something to look for. I'm, I've actually noticed that the blue driver in that case, generally the pedal transitions are okay. 
um, throughout the lap, although there are some instances where the pedal comes off early and slow, and then that's represented in the way they apply the brake pedal. Um, but this driver is actually probably doing a pretty good job in most cases of, of applying the brake quickly from the throttle pedal. Uh, but they're just a little more unsure about how they're using the brakes to slow the car down, whereas the, the yellow driver is far more proactive. Okay. So I'm going to work with this blue driver on, on more specific visual references and more specific visual timing. Because um, this, this blue driver is far less confident in exactly how much they want to slow down, where they want to slow down, and most importantly, why they're slowing down. Perfect. I, I went ahead and I fixed the brake pressure stuff real quickly there so you could kind of see it. And certainly in this corner, the, the blue one is coming way off it. And then a big dab at the end where the yellow one is committed to the to the corner, as you were mentioning. So mm -hmm. uh, pr pretty good. Uh, let me see if I can fix that steering angle really quickly. I think I can. Let me just go to the steering and let's just, uh, oh, it's already been reversed. That's why it's like that probably. There we go. Um, but look at the big, the big, uh, big oversteer moment here on uh, with the yellow one hustling it into that corner, right? And mm -hmm. you can see that uh, maybe he pushed it uh, on that one, um, probably just a tick too much because it went big oversteer and then, then understeered right at the, right at the apex, right? That was and that was under braking, which is interesting because normally yeah. those cars are pretty stable on the brakes. It, um, it, it so is a big, big curve though. It is a, yeah, it, it is on yeah. the arc end, but, uh, but yeah, it's uh -huh. it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Okay. So there, there we got an idea of how you would take uh, one driver and just their lap, and then maybe a, another teammate or or your reference lap, and and the things that you would be looking at. It was a lot. What I heard at least was a lot of the same things, but you're having more information in order to solve them quicker, and 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 help the driver get the information that they were after. So pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good. The um, uh, while I change over to Ray Studio Three here real quick, there's a there was a question that uh, came up. How about two cameras? Um, a front facing you know, out and then one coming from the side showing the driver. Do you find that there's value, uh, decent value of a, of a side shot of the driver or is it best to have the, what, you, what you're seeing and that I mean, you could put the two videos side by side, but what do you think about a dri camera right on the driver? Uh, it's, it's probably the best option if, if you can manage it, honestly, because it, 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 the first thing it solves is the exposure. And normally the exposure settings is your challenge in a car that has a roof to see both the detail in the driver and the detail out the windshield. So separating the two camera angles is a great way of getting the best possible view of both things. Um, but if you can isolate a camera just on the driver, you learn a lot more about things I suggested earlier as far as, as head position and, and timing of, of visual cues. Um, and you could, you could get a better idea of all those driving inputs in isolation. And if you can, you could do that in a picture in picture format uh, on the display as you're watching it, it's the best because it gives you that, that relative timing tool to, to use as well. But I'm a big fan of that um, if, if, if it's doable. Perfect. Uh, the uh, uh, Tice had a question in here that, uh, and we noticed that we just went past it really quickly. It, the the blue driver here, turn one, coming into turn one, was a big was a big lift, big early. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that that does not appear to be a typical thing for the driver. Yeah, it, it, normally he's pretty good with transition from throttle to brake. So it was what mm -hmm. to me it was there was a car in his way, or you know there, there was another external reason that that happened. So we didn't uh, at least that's why I didn't chat about it. What about you, Thomas? Yeah. Or, I mean, it, it, that could be a comfort thing. I know turn one at Homestead is, is really intimidating. And the way the driver's releasing the throttle on approach there and then applying the brake, it, it, it looks like, like the driver's less confident. And I would actually look towards where we looked at the possible lazy shift as um, more of actually the same kind of thing. So coming off that hairpin, there's a kink to the right that okay. can be done flat, but is difficult to do so. Oh, okay. And so the driver is probably pedaling the car a little bit through there based on their confidence. But what I would suggest to this driver is say, you know, look, look how well you're, you're defining your throttle lift there coming off of that hairpin. You're lifting to about 50% throttle until you're comfortable and then you're going back to full. Let's use that tool over there in turn one, rather than lifting, holding a throttle as deep as you can, and then uh, be a nondescript about how you're using the right foot. Let's crack back to 75 or 50% throttle and hold that steady to the brake zone. Keep the car platformed and give yourself an idea of how the car is going to feel when you do carry full throttle there with the same sort of attitude in the car. Um, it's, it's, it's not always about going, okay, the reference looks like this, let's go do that. It's more about, okay, how can I make it easy to make the car feel the way it should so I can build confidence and then eventually work towards that 
particularly in a really fast race car, um, you're not going to make a lot of progress by forcing the issue. It's more about how can I make it easier? How can I make it feel right um, so that I can get more out of the car confidently? Uh, if the driver's confident, they're going to be fast. It's That's pure and simple. So um, I'd focus less on the intensity of the activity and more about how can I minimize okay. that? How can I control it? Ah, interesting. That's a whole different approach than what a lot of people may may do. So you to get the car, to get the driver comfortable in the car and get the car comfortable, the speed will come, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. The um there was a question here that and I'm gonna jump to Ray Studio three and 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 fit it into here, but um Kyle asks in sedan that 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 brake G trace, right? That you've got that that deceleration uh, coming mm -hmm. down. And um and he and he talks about it generates with two peaks and it basically what he's thinking is, is with soft suspension, you know, stock sedan, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of production based race cars, you know, you get that, that roll at that, 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 uh, that uh, dip in the nose and you can get a, a bit of a double peak. Is that, uh, do you find that to be true at all? It's the, I have not found that too much, but uh, uh, what do you think about that soft cars? I've not necessarily found that to be super true as far as the double peak. Um, in, in general, in my experience, it's, it, it, the car is always going to slow down more efficiently when it's moving at high speed. So the earlier you can identify that, that peak brake pressure and that decel rate, the better. Although, depending on the car and the design, I, I raced a Formula Ford for a year where you simply couldn't jump on the brake pedal because the car was so light, it needed to find its braking platform before you could brake heavy. So there was a, a tip-in moment as far as the brake application. However, I would say that as far as the braking trace goes and, and as far as the decel trace goes, we always want to avoid a convex shape, particularly from the halfway point to the apex. And that's what you see a lot of the times is, is a driver will increase their decel rate approaching the apex in the last bit of the brake zone, and they'll give up a lot of performance in doing so because that effectively what they're doing is killing momentum. They're, they're pinning the nose of the car to the ground. They're, they're, they're making the car slow down at its most right before they're turning in, which makes the, the relationship between the brake release and the steering input difficult to manage. And so in general, if there is a, a, a tip in required on that brake application, it should only be the first third of the brake zone, let's say. And from then on, it should kind of have that hockey stick shape like any other car would generally. The 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 video the the data that I have up here it's our friend Matt Romanowski I don't think he's here today but uh, you can see on this one braking zone right here in in segment seven uh, the green one he was uh, he was a little bit you know, a little bit faster and then he really tightens it up and it really did affect his mid corner speed right kind of mm -hmm. what you were just uh, what you were just chatting about right so exactly. he ended yeah. up really messing this up and it hurt him uh, at the middle of the corner that that's a visual I think of what you were explaining just now I, I noticed. Totally. And that's the benefit of this software too, is you can see those two laps on video and you can get an idea of, you know, if he did turn in earlier on the green lap and then have a sense that he needed to add more brake, you know, by how much did he make that mistake? And, 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 and most importantly, why? Um, super helpful tool. Yeah. The, um, uh, David asked a question that I, that is always intriguing. I find different drivers uh, do this in different ways and, and it'd be interesting to get your uh, approach from a driver coach standpoint. Do you re recommend that the brake reference point be between the driver and the apex or using typical markers like a, a corner marker or a crack in the road or a, a curb starts or, you know, or do you do it visually and, and just watch your way in there? How, how do you do that? And then how do you coach that? That's a good question. Um, the most important thing to understand about braking markers is everyone interprets them differently. And uh, through years of driver coaching, I've learned that the hard way is by telling someone to brake somewhere and they interpret that differently. And all of a sudden they're braking either too early or, or you know, God forbid, too late. Yeah. Um, and what, one common through line that I, that I noticed with all drivers is if they have a visual of a braking marker, that usually means the braking marker is in front of the car. So the car isn't actually at the three board when you're braking at the three board. You're, you're using a sense of depth perception to that point as your primary reference. Interesting. Personally, what, what I like to do is I like to use a throttle two reference rather than a braking reference. Mm. So I know I'm gonna be full throttle two X and I could quantify that a lot better than where I'm braking. Cause I can, I find personally, if, I, if I'm full throttle to the three board, then I brake and enter the corner. I'm usually alongside the three board when I get off the throttle versus if I'm planning on braking at the three board, I'm probably gonna brake a little bit before the three board 
um, and, and so on and so forth. That's my personal experience. But the, the main thing is, is back to the preparation, looking at data and looking at video. How does the driver interpret their own braking references? And then what makes the most sense as far as adjusting those? Um, I like using references that aren't going to move. Um, so my home track Laguna Seca is one of the worst because the, the, the number boards themselves actually don't maintain their position ever. The, the, they'll move. If oh, the driver boy. goes off and hits them, they'll put them back in a different spot. They don't actually have markers for where they put those. And sometimes you'll crest the hill and turn one, there's going to be a four board. Sometimes there's not. Oh, boy. <laughs> so oh, boy. Um, I'll, I'll use painted lines. I'll use curbing. I'll use even sight pictures, things you know that aren't going to change are far more valuable for, for references than, you know, something variable. But I think having some ownership over your individual, you know, tendencies as a driver, as far as your references, I think it's the most important thing. Um, there is no one right answer for that. Interesting that um, uh, my son was a driver for a while and uh, he did it by looking at the apex and just picking it out and, and drove mm -hmm. visually uh, mm -hmm. to the break point and, and he would hit the brakes and turn in and he was successful. Uh, yes. Many other people would find something, right? But it was what I heard you say there, though, it was enlightening to me. Even if it's the three board, you're, it's still a visual perception. And when you hit it mm -hmm. and, and do it, whether or not you're using a, the apex as that visual or the crack in the road or that clump of grass or that tree or whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be that you, that you, is your brake marker. Uh, it's still a visual game at the, at the end of the day and a timing based on your visual. So uh, pretty yeah. interesting, pretty interesting. The, um, um, David had a question, that, as, and we're probably going to end up tight, kind of closing it up with some of the couple here, is uh, if you do not have another driver to compare, uh, and frankly, uh, even if you do, uh, do you base, uh, let me back up, how do you determine a driver is not carrying enough speed through the corner, right? So you're, you're looking at this, this corner here, and, and you're looking at the speed trace, a couple of his laps or, or your lap against them or whatever. Do you base that on speed? Uh, are you looking at the speed number or are you basing it on the lateral G, the, the, the actual amount of G captured in that corner? Uh, how, or is it a balance of both of those? That's, that's the hardest thing is, yeah. is you know, knowing what it could do without, without the, the objective data to prove it. And a lot of times the lateral G can be deceiving because some corner might, might be banked, others yeah. might not, others are off camber or downhill. Um, so that, that also can be difficult. Something that I'll look for is mid corner speed relative to entry speed, okay. um, and and something like if you go to over there to turn one, um, you can see on, on the red lap um, he overslowed the corner, he picked the power up sooner, and he accelerated up to his his apex speed, so that the corner entry speed was lower than the apex speed, yeah. and all the, it, I, I'm always looking for the entry speed to to gradually approach the mid, middle of the corner. Uh, have a, a well-defined minimum speed and then um, a good acceleration beyond that. But what you can also see in that in that comparison is the other lap where he tried to carry more speed, he didn't get as good of an exit. Exactly. Um, the delta time, it was about of a, it was, it was a little bit of a wash, but somewhere in between those two is a more ideal strategy um, and, and a little bit more proactive as far as how, how we define the middle part of the corner and and what what is the the maximum speed and what what can be more helpful with that is actually the steering trace to see if 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 the steering trace comes up and the lateral g doesn't we know we're we're sort of achieving the limit of the tire um in some way shape or form and helping the driver proactively understand how can i identify the limit of the car what does it feel like and then how can i replicate that um that's more of a process particularly like you said if you don't have the reference data you got to go, okay, well, I need to find an area where, you know, there's, there's relatively low consequence. Um, I can feel the car really, really well. And then I'm going to find the limit of the tire proactively in, in a, in a, in a methodical way. The, a great example of what you just mentioned is right here, right? Uh, mm -hmm. On this turn mm -hmm. is where Matt is at. His, he has hit his peak lateral G, more or less, or pretty close, right? 
it's, mm -hmm. it's starting to plateau right about there, but his hands continue to turn. And there's another additional, you know, seven to eight degrees of, of turning. You can see, even see it in his hands in the video. And yet the, the, it has not built any more G. So he's probably approaching that corner. Maybe there's some movement left or right he should do, but he is, uh, that what, that tells me that he's probably getting as much out of the entry of that corner as he can get because the car is, uh, is talking back saying, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you any more, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually, when you look at that a little bit deeper, it's an interesting scenario because he's turning more and he, he, he's not getting any more lateral G, but he's actually carrying less speed than, than the, the compare lap. Exactly. And so there, there's, there's something to be found in how you're approaching the center of the corner, whether or not he's on the brake too much, or maybe he turned in too soon. Maybe he's he's way offline. Uh, he, which he, the video in this shows. case, in this case um, it's, he's way well left uh, uh, on the green. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There you go. You tied it all together, right? You went to the data mm -hmm. where we started this today. You, you said data gives me the what happened and where, and sometimes the video will give me the why. And I think we just ran mm -hmm. into that, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Perfect. I appreciate that. The uh, If we can just get a couple more questions is, as we're kind of winding this up, uh, the um, uh, Andy asked a question early on, and I thought it was kind of in intriguing. I thought it'd be a great closing question. Uh, Talk a little bit about a turbo car versus a normally aspirated car and the driver coaching that goes around that. Do you mm -hmm. find that there's anything different needed there? I mean, there is a little bit of the different, the way the boost comes on and, and how you exit the corner, but is that about the only spot you would coach differently? Yeah. And, and I think that the biggest difference there would, would be, would, would need more details as, as far as what, is it a turbo formula car? Is it a turbo sedan? Is it, is it a heavy car versus a light car? You know, obviously, different throttle behavior is required in the turbo car relative to the way the turbo spools up, and so for sure, there's there's differences there. Um, but I find that the weight of the car matters more um, than how the power is delivered relative to how you drive it, um, particularly if it's an aero car versus a non-aero car. Um, so it may be more of a point and shoot strategy versus a a roll speed strategy. Um, but absolutely there's, there's differences with, with anything. And I think in yeah. understanding your car in, in as much depth as possible is, is really important. And that's why having a good baseline setup is, is probably the best thing to, to look at doing. If you're a, if you're a guy that likes doing track days or, or you're a club racer and, and you've got, you've got a car that you run a lot, you definitely want to make sure it's a known quantity. Um, a lot of times you, you, you could be chasing something that, that you didn't know was there. Um, or that thought was you thought was normal. I, I've coached a number of guys who say uh, I get in their car and I drive it. I say, man, this thing's trying to kill me. And he goes, oh, I thought that's how all, all cars were. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so a lot of times it's like, let's just get the, the the vehicle you're in. Let's let's make a known quantity there. Find someone who's really good at, at giving you a baseline setup so you can go. Okay, I know that I know that the car is good. Now I can focus on myself. Interesting that uh, the, the turbo versus normally aspirated, uh, heavy versus light, formula car versus, mm -hmm. those are all things that you as a driver coach are experienced at and, and added value to the person you're coaching because you know which one to mm -hmm. go towards, right? That's, a, right. that's an interesting yeah. way that we went off on that question into the, the, the value of experience and knowing which of these are the important ones to focus on early on. Kind of cool. Mm -hmm. One last one. I, sorry, I don't get to be, not going to be able to get to all of them, but I have one more as I kind of transition back to the presentation, I'm going to ask this question. Kyle asks, what do you think about the minimum speed being after the apex in today's philosophy of chasing corner entry time versus the exit? Uh, it, it's a question that, uh, that, uh, that I see, and especially in karting, we see these people, they'll, they'll come in and they'll rotate the cart really hard. They'll come in, they'll overspeed in, rotate like crazy and, all, and almost look like they're losing speed, but they're using the yaw of the car to kind of slow it down, get that entry, you know, make some time up there and then yet try to get the uh, exit speed out as good as they can. Do, do you, uh, your general coaching technique, is it, is, is there an apex and you're trying to get them to hit that? Or do you, do you favor cheating each side or is it about whatever follows? If it's a long straightaway, you, your, your exit speed really is most important. If it's a short straightaway, maybe your entry is more mm -hmm. important. What do you think about that concept? I think it's a great question. And, and uh, it, it just makes me think of my, my number one rule in motorsport for myself and everything that I do. There is never one right way to do anything. There you go. And, <laughs> and if I'm going to coach somebody with a different driving style than me, I'm not going to teach them my style. I'm going to teach them how to use their style better. And I, I really like them, an aggressive driver because you usually can, can get them to try different things more readily uh, than a driver that's maybe more reserved. 
And so if they're really good at carrying entry speed, we'll go, okay, let's change how we're doing that to see if there's more performance there. And, or, you know, maybe let's, let's adjust the entry speed a little bit to see if there's more exit speed there. But you brought up a good point. And, you know, sometimes it's corner relative. If, if, if one corner leads very shortly to another one, maybe exit speed isn't terribly important. At the end of the day, it's it, it's the money channel, right? It's that speed channel yeah. and uh, yeah. speed channel and lap times. Those are our two money channels, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you want to yeah. try something, let's go try it and 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 let's let, let's look at the data and let's figure out what uh, what worked better. I I I, I like that. So let's, uh, we are just running just a minute or two late and, and I appreciate everything. We could chat for another couple hours, I think, and it would, and it would be a great time. It was a, uh, it was a very, uh, very informative uh, webinar. I think a lot of people enjoyed it. Um, we'll talk about this video. Uh, we, we talked about some stuff fairly quickly and uh, this video, just like all of our webinars will be going up on YouTube uh, within an hour or two. I do them just as fast as I can get uh, the, the data transfer and write up the descriptions and all that. So it'll be up there fairly shortly. Um, it'll join, uh, it'll be number 156 up there on the, on the, on the webinar, on, on the YouTube page. Uh, so everybody take a look at that uh, when you get there. The um, AIM is a customer support company. And uh, just, like, just like Thomas, always trying to help all the customers as much as we can, we do the same thing. And, and uh, we're, we're hitting a lot of tracks. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're out there all the time as best we can with our, with our sprinter vans. And if we don't take those, we've got a backpack and we're walking around. Uh, look for us at the track or, or give us a call if you have any questions or, or, or issues with any of your uh, hardware or software. Look forward to helping everybody out. Um, the next driver coach in our series that uh, we're just going to kind of build on all of these and, and chat with different people. Looking forward to this one too. Mark, Mark Miller is going to join us next Tuesday. Going to be a great time. The, uh, I met Mark, uh, uh, gosh, back when my son and him raced in the uh, MX-5 Cup Series. He's always been a good friend. Actually, I think I met him before that with uh, through some karting things, now that I think about it. And uh, he's going to be uh, fantastic to talk to. He's, uh, he's raced uh, not only professionally here in Trans Am with you quite a bit, Thomas, obviously, yeah. uh, but also in uh, uh, all the way over to the 24-hour Le Mans uh, as, as in, in his road racing, uh, Daytona, uh, all, all over the place. So looking forward to having Mark. He's a good guy uh, and is very good at what he does. So looking forward to have Mark join us here next, next week. It'll be a good time. The um, contact information for Thomas, if you're interested in chatting with him in, any deeper about this or grabbing him at a, at a racetrack uh, an upcoming weekend, there's some contact information for him, uh, Instagram, uh, email, and, and his website. Um, go ahead and uh, give Thomas a call out if you have any, uh, anything that you'd like to chat about. That would be, uh, I think that would be great. Uh, yeah, please Thomas do. Thomas had a great time here, and I know I know that you're a busy guy. And uh, and and we chatted a little bit before we got started here today. That uh, turns out Tuesdays are a good day for uh, for for uh, most of our folks, and that's the reason we pick Tuesdays. Is uh, yeah. it's it's a ways away from the. It's right after a weekend, but it's got a little bit of time heading in there, so we we can get our uh, motorsports related guests to come in. So I appreciate you coming. I know it's a little bit of a extra work for you, but it's a uh, it's fun, and I I really enjoyed it. Anything else you'd like to kind of add as we're kind of closing things down? Well, no, Roger, I, I thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. I, I noticed watching the, the chat, there's a lot of questions that unfortunately we didn't get to answer. So <laughs> exactly. we're going to have to do this again sometime soon. And, and uh, I'd, I'd really enjoy that. I, I, I hope you will. And we will invite you back. Uh, maybe we'll have another one of these down the road where we can bring in uh, some different coaches and maybe talk about some different, uh, different styles and build upon what we've just done. So I appreciate you coming. I appreciate everybody for coming and all the good questions. They were great this week. Uh, appreciate it. If uh, the chat, uh, the questions and answers, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube later, they'll uh, be linked down into the description box, in including all of the uh, all of Thomas's uh, contact information will be down there as well. So thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing you all next week with, uh, with Mark. Talk to you soon.